Haas, producing in Dodan, a Masada Khan in New Dubai. My name is Ozawa Anakwa In English, it is Alicia Kozlowski, and I am the Community Relations Officer for the City of Duluth. And on behalf of the entire City of Duluth, it is my absolute honor to welcome you all here to the State of the City. And we have a phenomenal evening lined up for all of you, whether you're tuning in on TV, at home, online, or here in this gym, we couldn't be more excited and grateful for the opportunity to gather together. And to begin, I would ask that you please rise if you're able for the posting of the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Again, welcome. Just a friendly reminder, if you could please silence your cell phones and electronic devices, we would greatly appreciate that. We have elected officials here with us this evening that we would like to recognize. We have members of the Duluth School Board, which by the way, it is a school board meeting night and we're extra grateful for the Duluth School District for hosting us here in this space tonight. We also have members of the Duluth uh, City Council, the Fond du Lac Nation, St. Louis County Board, and state legislators. Thank you so much for your tremendous work and for your presence here tonight. Thank you as well. Yes. Thank you as well to the many city staff for your service and the heart that you put into our community. And speaking of heart and community, I am proud to invite Stacy Achterhoff, uh, Intervention Teacher for the Families in Transition Program for ISD 709, to the stage to share a few remarks. I give you Stacy Achterhoff. Welcome. Welcome to Myers Wilkins Elementary in the East Hillside neighborhood of Duluth. She said, my name is Stacy Afterhoff. I'm a teacher and a small business owner. I've lived in Central or East Hillside for more than 20 years, and I currently live a short six block walk from this school, just down the hill from our mayor. We're so excited to have you all here. 
I can't believe you found a parking spot. <laughs> I sincerely hope some of you hopped on the number 11 to get here today because you'd save yourself a lot of trouble. I walked, so. Um, I, I worked with Hillside students and families for nearly two decades. And in the Hillside, we aren't suburban. We are, tell it to me straight, move your car on Sunday, City bus runs every 30 minutes. Watch the neighborhood kids from the front porch and holler when necessary. We know we live on native land. We know the systems we are working within and for and under have roots in racism, sexism, and genocide. And still we rise. We hope, we restore, we build community. Our parents here at school are often working two or more hourly wage jobs. They're working overnights, and then getting the kids off to school so they can get to the next job. And they don't do it because it's easy. They do it because hope for something better isn't always answered in prayer alone. Hope for something better for some folks in our city takes relentless tenacity. Myers Wilkins is a place where learning happens, but we are also food, clothing, after-school programs, enrichment programs, mental health, and medical care. Myers Wilkins is dedicated to restoring our family's relationship with public schools. We acknowledge that public schools are both a tool for familial economic growth and stability and a source of pain and disillusionment for some families in poverty or families of color. We continue to work to become a welcoming home for all of our children and families. And as a staff, we're dedicated to continued growth, to change, to do better, to be better. Our core values at Myers Wilkins are to be respectful, responsible, and safe. And we teach our children to restore relationships within school, that we all make mistakes, we all have failings. We all have moments of being disrespectful, irresponsible, and unsafe. And when those moments happen, we acknowledge and restore or relearn and we move on, just like a family. We rise, we hope, we restore, we build community. Welcome to our family. And I do this with the kids at school, so if, you, if kids wanna join me, you can palms touch, your forehead for peaceful thoughts, peaceful words, and peaceful actions. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you so much, Stacey, for those powerful and uplifting words to remind us of the strength of seeking higher ground and the power and thank you again to Myers Wilkins Elementary for hosting us here tonight. I have to say that working with Principal Warden in the ISD 709 staff was a phenomenal experience and you really set us up for a great night. And I also want to say thank you so much for swiftly swooping in and embracing all of us here tonight right on into your wolf pack. So thank you. Next, please help give me Give a warm welcome to Duluth City, a warm welcome to Duluth City Council President Noah Hobbs. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Noah Hobbs, President. Um, so as I thought about what I was going to say tonight, I thought about possibly reflecting on uh, the past year as Council President, or maybe my term uh, on the Council. Uh, or maybe the 100 Cups of Coffee project that I'm working on. Uh, but it doesn't feel uh, to me uh, to me to feel right to, to talk about myself. Uh, I don't know if that's due to the fact that I'm a lifelong Minnesotan or an ELCA Lutheran, uh, but it does not, uh, I don't feel comfortable talking about myself, and I certainly understand that's me a conflict uh, as being an elected official. Um, but knowing that, <laughs> Uh, knowing, thank you, Mayor Larson, uh, knowing that I may never have the opportunity to address uh, everybody uh, in this room in, in this manner again, I thought, what, uh, what should I say and uh, phrase 
Uh, I think every elected Duluth official is guilty of saying that we are a shining city of the hill kept coming to mind. Um, and I reflected on that phrase and thought more uh, about what that actually means. I think we kind of use it as a, as a throwaway line and, and don't really connotate what that means or what that, that shine is. Um, and so as any good millennial would do, uh, I asked my Instagram followers what, uh, what makes our city shine. And so some of the answers were uh, our arts community, um, the people, my neighborhood, the lake, the level of grit it takes to handle the winters, the diversifying of our local economy, and then I would also add a couple of others, and that would be that we have some of the highest voter participation rate uh, in the country. Um, yeah. And we have uh, numerous neighborhoods, and they all maintain uh, their own unique character from Leicester and Lakeside up to Fond du Lac area, New Duluth, and everywhere in between. We have several institutions of higher education, our proximity to the outdoors. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the state. Uh, and now we have back, uh, we're now home to back-to-back -back college national champions uh, as of Saturday. So, uh, do these reasons truly make us a shining city on a hill? I believe they do. Uh, but are we shining as brightly as we can? Maybe we are, maybe we're not. Uh, regardless, I believe we should always be striving towards a city that shines as bright as it possibly can. And I don't believe that there's one single uh, light that shines for all of us here in Duluth. I believe that each individual in this room and outside in our community are individual lights that shine to make up our collective shine as a city uh, on that hill. I believe that we become more luminous as individuals and as a society the more we commit ourselves to civic excellence. Our light shines more brilliantly when we show up in meaningful ways. So I ask you, are we showing up in uh, our personal lives as partners, as spouses, as parents, friends, and neighbors? Are we increasing our radiance by showing up in a meaningful way in the organizations that we are involved in, whether that's our employment or our volunteer opportunities that we choose to engage ourselves with, or are we simply going through the motions and just showing up? Are we adding to our civic dialogue or are we degrading it? Are we increasing our brightness as a community by acting on the principles of integrity, justice, and respect, or are we choosing the dimming path of dishonesty, injustice, and division? We don't become more luminous as a community by ignoring the issues of today and treating them with apathy and cowardice. We become more luminous as a community by tackling our issues head on with perseverance and a sense of urgency. There are two things that I know for sure. Uh, the first is that the philosophy that we're all in this together is a lot better than the philosophy of you're on your own. And the second is that the whole, uh, the sum of the parts is greater, uh, the, the greater, uh, the sum of the whole is greater than its parts. Um, and so as citizens, and as the faith, business, and nonprofit communities, and as government, we need to work together to make sure that we continue to be a shining city, and we should commit ourselves to make sure that we are shining as brightly as we can. I don't believe that this is going to be easy, but if we all work together, we not only will remain a shining city, but we can be the brightest city on a hill. So thank you for all that you do to make our community shine, and thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Councillor Helms. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the Myers Wilkins World Beat Drummers. World Beat is a group of students who learn and create music in the drumming tradition of Western Africa and many other countries around the world. The drummers perform at school, throughout the community, and across the state, including at Mayor Emily Larson's inauguration and State of the City addresses. This group is led by talented directors Terry Athervik and Michelle Bulger. Music is the universal language and World Beat speaks it. I share with you now, World Beat Drummers.
so much for that powerful song. We are truly grateful for the gift and for your sharing of the heartbeat of the drum, that pulse of the people with all of us. Uh, these young people, all of our young leaders, know this. You are the present and you are the future of Duluth. So thank you. Next, I am incredibly happy to share with you and welcome Duluth Poet Laureate Gary Bullhauer to the stage to share the poem entitled Beyond Potholes. <laughs> Gary was named Poet Laureate of Duluth for 2018 to 2020. He has published three poetry collections, Naming Rights, Marrow, Muscle, Flight, and Sacred Times, and Timeless Seasons. Gary was awarded the Holy Prize in Poetry from America Magazine, and his collection, Marrow, Muscle, Flight, won the Midwest Book Award in 2011. Gary is Professor Emeritus at the College of St. Scholastica, where he continues to teach about health humanities, healthcare ethics, dying and grieving, and leadership. His recent prose books include Choose Wisely, Practical Insights from Spiritual Traditions, and Mountain 10, Climbing the Labyrinth Within. Please help me welcome Gary Bullhauer. Beyond Potholes. Potholes, dips, and hollows are the easiest of our problems. A few tons of cold mix in April, hot mix in May. Meanwhile, slow down. Watch where you're going and don't text. The big problems can't be patched with asphalt or filled with fancy words. How shall we pave the thoroughfares of fairness? Create intersections where our common story connects all our neighborhoods with hope. Build the bridges that span our deep divides with promises that we keep. Zenith city of the unsalted seas, all platted by 1856. What are the rights that live in the land that cannot be cut and bound? Let us remember the first feet that ran these ridges and all our relations that still listen to the wind sing in these pines. Let us remember that we all enter as swimmers from the round lake of our mother, from the water nest of home, until the big wave pushes us to shore and we learn to crawl and walk on land and forget that water is life how it runs between the banks of our veins. City of millionaires, titan of timber and ore, let us not forget the child in chains, sick and uninsured, whose daddy is starving on needles under the highway, whose mommy is working two jobs that can't pay the bills. How shall we create a flag that includes all our colors, all our stories? How shall we compose a new anthem that repairs the severed trust, centuries of slavery, generations of trauma? What budget will count the calculus of loss Dreams deferred, voices silenced, lives taken by bullets and bullying and blindness. What edict can make us neighbors again? What resolution 
can give us the courage to reach across the fences, to write the policies of opportunity, create the curriculum of understanding. Can we hear the common beat, the heart's human drum in the arteries and avenues we travel from Fond du Lac to North Shore, from Chester, Lincoln, Lakeside to Denfeld, Endion, and the Hillside, from Observation Hill to Goat Hill, from Kenwood to Lakewood, how shall we pave the thoroughfares of fairness, create intersections where our differences and our dialogue Connect all of us with hope. Build the bridges that span our deep divides with promises that you and I keep. for shining new and deep perspective on potholes and beyond. That was truly perfection. Um, we are really fortunate and grateful to have such artists and storytellers here in our community. Next, I would like to welcome Chief Administrative Officer Noah Shuffman, who will be joined by Mayor Emily Larson to the stage to present the Clarence Maddy Award. Thank you. I am uh, finishing my fifth month on the job, and I've had already the unfortunate experience. Can you hear OK? No. You're too tall. You're too tall. Is this better? I'm sorry. How's this? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm finishing month five on the job. I've already had the unfortunate experience of having to try to follow the mayor uh, public speaking a few times. And I thought tonight I was out of the woods because I was gonna get to lead into the mayor. And instead I had to follow the poet. Oh, so. <laughs> so one of my favorite parts of the job is seeing firsthand the great work that City of Duluth staff do every day. I'm here to recognize one specific staff member, but before I do, how many city staff are here tonight? Would you please either stand up or raise your hands if you're already standing? Thank you, and thank you all for your hard work that you do on behalf of our community. I'd like to also ask Director of Workforce Development, Elena Fauché, to join us on stage. Clarence Maddy was a beloved former Chief Administrative Officer who worked for the City of Duluth for 22 years, serving five mayors, and was well respected by all of his colleagues. Some of Mr. Maddy's family are here tonight to honor this legacy. Thank you for being here. The Clarence Maddy Award is given to an employee who goes above and beyond their normal job description and provides valuable services to citizens and colleagues alike. The chosen recipient demonstrates leadership, uses creative approaches to problem solving, and provides excellent customer service, as Clarence Maddy did during his tenure with the city. This year's recipient is Carol Turner, who has worked in workforce development for the city of Duluth for almost 32 years. Carol was nominated by Director Fauché. She has been a dedicated, consistent, and stable force that has held the team and the department together through ups and downs. She has weathered a lot during her career with the city, floods, government shutdowns, and the Great Recession, as well as positive changes to Duluth's economy. Carol cares about people and is good at building relationships with city departments, workforce center partners, and St. Louis County and DEED staff. She is the person who knows the answer to every question and can get things done. Recently, Carol stepped in to lead the newly independent workforce development department during several months of transition while the city searched for director. Carol supervised staff, kept department budgets, and contract and contracted activities on track, excuse me, managed partnerships, staffed the workforce board, 
and generally did a tremendous job keeping things humming during this time. Carol also carefully documented and organized a huge amount of information for the new director to make sure that she could get up to speed quickly and effectively prioritize her work. As a result of Carol stepping up, staff felt supported during the transition, partnerships continued, all while Carol continued her regular job duties. Carol is a tremendous asset to the city and to the team. She loves her job and Duluth is happy to have her and lucky to have her. This year's recipient of the Clarence Matty Award is Carol Turner. that I didn't know that he was going to say. Um, so I'm going to start off by telling everybody I started with the city when I was 12. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary Larson, President Hobbs, counselors. I'm very honored to receive this award and very humbled at the same time. I also want to thank my director, Elena, for this opportunity. I have been honored to work for the city of Duluth for over 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always felt blessed to do so because I do work that is meaningful to me and I know that it's meaningful to other purpose. I love what I do and I have a great group of coworkers. Workforce development is a common thread that connects us. Oftentimes we're asked every day, what do we do for a living? Workforce development through its local workforce development board initiatives prepares people for the workforce, helps workers advance in their careers, and ensures a skilled workforce for, city, for our city to grow and to thrive. We strengthen Duluth's workforce for all people who live, and work and go to school and do business in the city of Duluth. No one does their job on their own. Our success depends on others to help us support and help us along the way. So I want to give just a couple of quick shout outs. One is to my family because they are the blessing that are in my heart and they're just good people. I also want to give a shout out to my co-workers, um, including Elena, and also the hundreds of other city workers who do exceptional work every day serving the city of Duluth. Because doing good work matters. I am a city worker, and I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you again so much, Noah, and again, congratulations, Carol. And now, it is truly my honor and joy to introduce, for her fourth State of the City Address, Mayor Emily Larson. excited to be here tonight. First of all, can you hear okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so before I begin my speech, a few thank yous. Thank you to Myers Wilkins. i really excited about the water bottle, by the way. And this one is mine. Like, you can't take it. Mine. <laughs> okay. Um, so big thank you to Myers Wilkins. Thank you to the World Beat Drummers. There, there were some familiar tunes there. To our honor guard, to our interpreters, Rebecca and Doug. 
to Pack TV, to our Denfeld Clock Tower Cafe. They have provided our refreshments, and so I in uh, invite you to join us afterwards. The DTA provided free transportation, and I thought that was really awesome. Gary Bohauer, your poem is beautiful, and it struck me to the core when I read it on Friday. Thank you for that gift to this community and your articulation. Uh, Alicia, you're doing a great job as MC. Like, you should, there you are, you should be MC of my life, everyone's life, it was so great. Eric Peterson, you are my co-conspirator, thank you very much. And our office team, Phil Jens, Bronwyn Bauer, Kate Van Deel, Billy Larson, Amanda Avenen, Steve Forslund. These events take a lot of work and you are an amazing team and being able to do this with you is, is really a gift and a joy. Noah Schuckman is our newish CAO, and it is wonderful to work with you, Noah. So I, I really enjoy coming to work with this team that we have, and you're a big part of that, so thank you. Carol Turner, that was so awesome, you won. Congratulations to you and your family. To the many, many staff who are here, it is truly an honor to go to work with all of you every single day. I have learned so much about what it means to be in community simply by watching you show up every day to do a lot of work that can be underappreciated by our public, but are, is really integral to what, how a city works, and it means a lot to me that you're here. We have a program this year, I hope you got one as you came in, and inside is listed um, two lists that are really important, and I, I do just wanna point that out to you. Our city council, we have nine city councilors, uh, five district councilors, four at-large councilors, they give a tremendous amount to this community, and that um, it is not for the high pay or the glamour that comes with it. So thank you, City Council, for all of your hard work and the service of your families and your loved ones as well. Uh, and our leadership team is listed. That team of leaders includes our directors, and some managers as well. These, and it's important for me that you see who's in the room when we make decisions. That leadership team is the group that, uh, you know, we meet every week and we talk through all the tough issues and all the great issues, all the fun issues, but that is the group that has really the strong pulse of decision making uh, for the city of Duluth. Thank you, President Hobbs, for your comments tonight. Uh, and to my elected and appointed colleagues who are in the room, it is a pleasure and honor to have you. Uh, for my family, I have three parents here tonight, Narita and Pam and Lee. Thank you for being here, thank you for raising me. I miss our fourth parent, Gigi, tonight very much, but he is always with us in spirit. And to my husband, Doug, and our sons, Gabe and Eli, um, thank you for who you are for who you remind me we are, for what it is we, the work that, that we do together. This is, um, it's really big what you give. I'm not sure if you realize it, but it means the most to me. And at the end of the day, when we're unpacking all of the hard stuff and all of the big stuff and all of the good stuff, it is you for me. It is the voice in my head. So thank you. Thank you, Dougie. So I'd like to start first tonight by acknowledging the traditional native inhabitants and custodians of this land, both past and present, on which we meet today, the Anishinaabe peoples and other tribal nations, prominently including the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. And I want to pay my respects to ancestors before us and elders who are with us today. I also wish to extend my warmest regards and thanks to Kevin Dupie, Fond du Lac Chairman, for being with us here tonight. Over the past three years, I have been honored to get to know you and to work with you and to learn from you. And your presence here is really an honor. Thank you. We start this evening by acknowledging our place, our people, and our history because these are the elements that ground us. They connect us. They call us home. Being here also feels like I'm welcoming you into my home. We live just a few blocks from here, and I would have invited you all to my living room, but it is kind of a small house, usually kind of dirty, and that just wouldn't have worked very well. But this neighborhood, the hillside, it is my home. It isn't flashy or fancy, but for me, 
It is real, and it is honest, and it's a depiction of our city. It's got the things I love about Duluth. Smaller, more affordable houses, a rich mix of renters and homeowners and students, racial diversity, easy access to the outdoors, and some of the best lake views in town. And it has some of the things that I do find slightly inconvenient about Duluth. Our steep, slippery hills, difficult parking, and just like everyone else, I, I think that um, in my neighborhood have the, have the worst streets. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> and still, this is home. On my morning run, I head across a few unfinished alleys and backyards into Chester Park. Our kids learn to ski and snowboard in that park. We'd send them off with 75 cents for gummy bears. They would ski or snowboard all afternoon and then jump off at the top of the lift, cut through the woods, cross skyline, and ski home to our backyard. And this is our neighborhood school. Our son Eli was part of the same drumming group we heard from earlier tonight. Back when he went to school here, that was five years and a foot and a half ago. <laughs> and our son Gabe graduates from high school this year. And as is the new tradition in Duluth, he will be doing his, his gown walk back here in Myers-Wilkins. You are ready to launch into the world. And the gown walk is a way of returning home, of recognizing and honoring where you came from and who helped you along the way. So I am particularly pleased that we're here tonight at Myers Wilkins School, named after two powerful and visionary women, Ruth Myers and Marjorie Wilkins. This school embodies the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Ruth Myers was born in 1926, a proud member of the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. As a child, she was taken from her family, sent to an Indian boarding school. This painful experience shaped her life, and she came through that pain and harnessed it to inspire positive change. Ruth was known as a woman of integrity who knew who she was, she never forgot it. She refused to be silent, and she was known by others as Uncouth Ruth from Duluth. <laughs> Ruth became known as the grandmother of American Indian education in Minnesota, recognized by the University of Minnesota with an honorary doctorate for her life work with young people, and for her calling us to look beyond ourselves and to help people in need. Ruth was an organizer, too. Active in the community, Ruth served on dozens of boards and commissions, but oftentimes she would send others to the meetings in her place. Just one way she lifted others up and empowered new generations of leaders. Ruth's friend and co-conspirator for change Marjorie Wilkins was an African-American community activist. Marjorie was one of a small number of African-Americans born in Duluth just after the 1920 triple lynching of three black circus workers here in downtown Duluth. She was denied entry into nursing school and persevered to become the first African-American woman to graduate from St. Mary's School of Nursing. Later, she became the first African-American anesthetist at St. Luke's Hospital. Every day, Marjorie and Ruth faced discrimination because of their race and gender. They both worked tirelessly to break down the racial and economic barriers that often thwart dreams and break lives. Both live the value that we rise or fall as a whole community, or as my friends in labor say, an injury to one is an injury to all. Their tradition continues here today at Myers Wilkins, deeply passionate teachers who throw down every single day to support our kids. 
community members who see the success of these kids as their responsibility too. If you spend just a short time in this school, you will see high fives and hugs and smiles. You will feel the energy. But most importantly, you will feel loved and respected. I wanted to tell these stories before I launch into a more typical State of the City address because as mayor, I have learned that embracing our complexity, the richness and difficulty of our lives and our history together, that is our path forward. Seeing, naming, and listening is our first step in healing, and they are how we build a welcoming home together. In the rest of the speech, I want to lay out where we've been, where we're heading. Let's start with four quick highlights of what's happened just this year. So I'm gonna start with streets. And I, I do know that our streets need work, like a lot of work, and there are no easy answers. But still, we are making progress. Last year, we worked with NRRI on a new and more durable way to patch potholes. And the good news is that the experiment appears to have worked and to have survived this, like the most worst pothole season in history. And now we just need to figure out if we can make the progress quicker, that process quicker, and bring it to scale, both here in Duluth and around the region. We successfully finished the first phase of the Superior Street rebuild and started phase two. We tried everything we can to squeeze more streets funding out of our existing budget. We continue to work with the state to secure legislative sign off on our proposed sales tax, which has already been approved. 77% of Duluth voters and when passed, it will raise $7 million more each year for our streets. My second highlight is all of the local investment and construction we're seeing in Duluth. There are real signs of economic confidence and optimism for our future. Essentia is investing $800 million into a new hospital campus and St. Luke's is investing 400 million, all within our downtown in hillside neighborhoods. And this is a big deal. We welcome it. We are ready for it. We're working at the Capitol to make it happen. And we are making sure that the critical needs for housing, for parking, for connectivity is being reflected in all of the projects that will be taken care of. Highlight three, I think you already know actually that I'm kind of geeky when it comes to planning, but I also love math. <laughs> and I, I just can't get enough of our priority-based budgeting. And maybe it's a little dorky, but just wait, because I think you can get hooked too. So this is the first year that we've implemented this. It, Duluth is the first city in the state of Minnesota to adopt this staff and community-driven budgeting practice. And what's exciting, at least to me, maybe hopefully our Chief Financial Officer, Wayne Parson, is that for the first time ever, we actually know exactly what each city service we provide costs. So major kudos to Wayne and his team and to all of our city staff who have done an enormous amount of work to help make this transition possible. I think it'll be worth the effort because budgets represent our values and priorities in numbers. And now we can more precisely ensure that our values align. And so I do have an ask tonight, actually, before you leave, get some refreshments, thanks to Denfell, and then swing by a table that's in the back there and vote on your budget priorities for us as a city. So speaking of priorities, my fourth highlight tonight is neighborhood youth programming. And yes, youth programming will be back in the parks this summer. That is 
worthy. Yeah, that is great. We have hired two new staff, and in partnership with the YMCA, we are providing youth day camps in the Morgan Park and Piedmont neighborhoods. We're also piloting a mobile program that partners with community groups to provide outdoor education and recreation opportunities. Think biking and rock climbing, frisbee golf, paddling. Duluth is an outdoor destination where over 6.7 million, 6.7 million people come from all over the world to enjoy. And everyone, every single resident in our city limit lives within 1,000 feet of a trail. 1,000 feet. There is no other city in the country that can say that. And yet many young Duluthians have no idea that there are trails near where they live. So we aim to change that. Of course, this is about having fun and providing safe and creative activities for our youth. But it is also about building stronger connections to this place, our home, and each other. It's about building shared experiences and relationships between people, such as Women Hike Duluth, whose monthly trail walks have connected hundreds, like hundreds of women of all ages and all abilities from across the city. So these are just a few stories of the many ways we're investing in our future and building on our strengths as a community. So where are we headed? During my first term, we focused on taking on the historic inequities and big challenges that divide and test this community. The quality of your parks or your streets shouldn't be determined by your zip code. Your safety and security should not be determined by where you live or by your race or by your religion. It is fundamentally wrong that a person living in Lincoln Park has a life expectancy 11 years less than a person living in Compton. These disparities are generational in the making and they will take years of persistent focus and purpose to solve. In our first term, we laid out four key priority areas to give us focus improving streets and other public infrastructure, connecting jobs with those who need them, making Duluth more sustainable and energy resilient, and meeting our, our housing shortage. We haven't solved any of these massive challenges yet, but still we have taken real steps forward. During my first term, we have proactively reached out to repair relationships and collaborate with St. Louis County, the Fond du Lac Band, and community partners. We've laid the foundation for bigger things to come. During my first term, we've made the case that city government needs to become more inclusive, more collaborative, more fair, more transparent. We have worked to listen and to include more voices and ideas. We've met with thousands of people across the city. And we, our leadership team, we operate by a mantra that the people most affected by our decisions need to be included in those decisions or our efforts are doomed to fall short. We have made mistakes, to be sure. But three years in, I hope people feel a bit more connected and included, a bit more hopeful and confident that their stories will be heard and make a difference. Ultimately, it is that confidence that I belong, that you are welcome, that your voice matters, that will make or break everything we do as a city and as a community. So Duluth, we are on a roll. We're riding a surge of momentum, national recognition, hometown pride. This year, we're gonna be home to the International TV Fest, the Independent TV Fest. We're also home to Olympic gold medalists, 
back-to-back -back national hockey champions, and I am proud of what we've done together. And yet, despite positive job growth and new economic energy, despite that, for the first time in a long time, there are more jobs than active job seekers. There are still too many people who can't secure a job, housing or childcare that meets their needs. Despite good news on our local efforts to transition to renewable energy, climate change increasingly inflicts more and more damage on our community. Jobs, childcare, housing, energy, these are urgent problems that we can't wait to solve. So let's take each of them on. First, jobs. I know that City Hall doesn't actually create jobs as much as we mayors sometimes like to take credit. But we can and must redouble our efforts to make sure everyone who wants a decent job can find one. So with the hiring of Workforce Director Elena Fauché and the elevation of her role, we are integrating workforce development and career pathways into everything we do as a city. And despite historically low unemployment rates last year, 7% of construction jobs, 8% of healthcare jobs, and about one in five service jobs went unfilled. Disparities persist along racial lines, with African American and Native American residents four times more likely to be excluded from a job. So, for my white friends in this audience, this racial disparity is our problem. If these statistics were about our families, if this dynamic of economic inequality were impacting our kids, we would be screaming from a mountaintop, I know it. And if we don't address these disparities, they threaten the economic health and vitality of our whole community. Because as Paul Wellstone said, we all do better when we all do better. wait. We can't just wait for someone to offer help. And the market left to its own devices has done little to fill these worker shortages or erase our racial disparities. So here's where we're headed. We need to build a talent pipeline to fill job vacancies in key sectors of our economy and smash persistent disparities across race and gender. Working with the Duluth Building Trades and other community partners, we've taken a first step to address disparities and job shortages in the construction trades. Now, on every significant construction project the city financially supports, we are now creating career pathways for women and others who face structural disadvantages that block their opportunities for work and a career. We will proactively seek to work with builders and businesses who embrace creating job opportunities for those currently without jobs. Partners who see this both as a personal priority for their business, as well as the key to building shared economic prosperity across our community. We will partner with healthcare employers, educational institutions, and the hospitality industry to build strong pathways that provide workers a variety of career options. Duluth's Career Force Center will form a group of employer workforce champions, a group of business leaders who are committed to working together to create and help lead innovative citywide efforts to tackle our workforce shortages and connect people with meaningful work. And the city of Duluth, as one of the area's largest employers, we will sit at this table of champions alongside others. Because we are committed to seeing this change happen as an employer and we too have a lot to learn. 
Second, and connected with jobs, is accessible and affordable childcare. A recent report identified a shortage of 2,600 childcare spots across St. Louis County. The economic cost of the shortage is immense. Employers lose millions of dollars in lost productivity, and families lose thousands in wages. Without childcare, many of our children are denied opportunities for a healthy start in this life. And this is stressful for families, and it's a burden for employers. And again, we just we can't wait. So here is where we are going. The city council just passed a zoning change that will allow child care facilities to be located closer to where parents work. And already several local businesses have stepped up and expressed interest to build child care facilities on site. Duluth's 1200 Fund is currently working to develop a revolving low interest loan program to help cover initial startup costs for home based child care and will continue looking for ways to eliminate barriers. And finally, I'm asking our Chief Administrative Officer, Noah Shuckman, to engage the county, the state, the school district, other community partners around jointly creating a downtown child care center for children of public employees and low-income downtown workers. is housing. And you may notice that I, I talk about housing every year. And that's because we still have a problem. We have helped catalyze the building of nearly 1,000 new houses and apartments. And this is a really meaningful step toward meeting our housing shortage. And yet we have failed to solve the puzzle of affordable housing. And we can't wait for someone else to solve this crisis. And let me be clear, it is a crisis. When people are not safely housed, their health suffers. Housing uncertainty harms children. It impacts our schools. On any given night, hundreds of people in Duluth have no home. Hundreds more worry if they'll have one next week. And this is simply unacceptable. We are morally obligated to figure this out. So here's where we're headed. For the first time, we will have a city staff fully dedicated to focusing and energizing our housing efforts. We are hiring a housing developer in planning and economic development a position shared with the Duluth Housing and Redevelopment Authority. This person will join a housing team and work with community partners to achieve our housing goals laid out in Imagine Duluth 2035. And to be clear, the barriers of affordability, the rising costs of construction, fewer state and federal resources, growing economic disparity, they are not unique factors to Duluth. They challenge cities across the country. 80% of people in America believe housing and affordable housing is at a crisis point. But we cannot let barriers derail us, nor can we simply replicate what we've done in the past. So for me, housing is a math problem. And somehow, we need to change the math equation. And to be honest, we don't have the answer here. And I actually think there's more than one answer. We need every answer we can find, every new and innovative idea. And we need your help. Toward that end, I will be working with Council President Hobbs to activate a mayor's task force on affordable housing. 
I'm calling on allies from the healthcare, business, county, and aging sectors, all who are impacted in different ways by the housing shortage, and all who can bring other allies in the community along. This task force is not going to debate or investigate whether we have a problem. We know we have a problem. Rather, they will have a very clear mandate. Come up with a long-term dedicated funding mechanism to address our affordable housing crisis. I will also be announcing soon a contest of ideas, Rebuild Duluth, a contest to unleash the ingenuity of Duluthians. The details will be forthcoming, but the concept is very simple. The city has developable full land. I'm going to say that again. The city has developable land. And we will identify and secure 10 to 15 parcels across the city and make an offer. If you come up with a good, achievable idea that can provide affordable housing on that land, it's yours for free. The city will help with all of the tools at our disposal, but what we need from you are new ideas and your drive to change the math and create new ways to imagine building affordable housing in our community. Finally, energy resiliency and sustainability. We said that we would reduce the city's greenhouse gas emissions by 15% in my first term, a down payment on our commitment to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. We will meet that 15% goal. With the full, oh, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Uh, with, the, with the full implementation of the steam plant conversion, we'll more than double that reduction by 2020. And a huge shout out to our energy team, Eric Berkland and Alex Jackson and Mike LeBeau. I think I saw, saw you walk in. We have made real progress. And yet, science and the sur survivability of our planet say that we must do more and do it faster. Climate change is pounding our city now. It is not some future threat. We saw its effects these last two Octobers when massive storms wreaked havoc across Duluth and twice took out our lake walk. We saw the very real effects of climate change in 2012 when we suffered over $100 million in flood damage. So we, we cannot, we just can't put this off for a more convenient time. We've made real progress, but pardon the pun, we do need to step on the gas. So we must move away from fossil fuels and build our infrastructure to be more resilient as we continue to face 500 year storms every few years. So here's where we're heading. The City Council just approved my new Energy Plan Commission, which will help develop the policies and drive the city strategy for greater energy efficiency and reducing greenhouse gases. And this is a start. But Duluth still doesn't have a comprehensive energy transition plan, one that connects to Imagine Duluth 2035 and provides a roadmap for how we reach our energy and sustainability goals. Nor do we have a set of city policies that drive energy efficiency across every department and office in the city. And significantly, we don't have a point person or office in charge of building those partnerships and strategies for energy transition for city government and across our community. 
I will therefore be asking the council to create a new sustainability officer position and office within the city of Duluth. This person will report directly to the chief administrative officer, work with the new energy plan commission, coordinate across city departments, build the community will and partnerships needed to develop and implement and monitor progress on a comprehensive energy and sustainability strategy for Duluth. We need to be bold in our vision and practical in developing the big steps we need to take. We need to move to 100% renewable electricity. We have pledged to reduce city government's greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by 2050. This is the city's commitment. But the city of Duluth organization, we are only 6% of Duluth's total emissions. And it is time that this becomes a community-wide commitment. We, the city of Duluth, owns two utilities, Comfort Systems and Duluth Energy Systems. So saving energy is really a no-brainer for us. But our utilities can and will do more to lead in the community and help customers, particularly low-income customers, make their homes and businesses more energy efficient. Together, for it truly will take all of us, we can rise to meet this challenge. I started tonight talking about rootedness, the resiliency that comes through relationships, the transformational power of belonging and feeling welcomed and respected. I'm talking now about how we build community and connection. Of course, we need to do better connecting job openings to people who need jobs. We need more childcare. We have to figure out affordable housing. And we must rapidly transition into a clean energy future. We need our streets fixed. But to do any of these, we also need each other. Particularly in these times of division and polarization, we need to remember we need to return to one another. We do this well in times of crisis. When we have a storm that tears up thousands of trees, neighbors come out with their chainsaws and help clear yards and open up city streets. When the Husky refinery exploded and threatened Duluth, faith communities, businesses, individuals across the city reached out through Facebook and Twitter to offer up their homes, check in on one another. When a blizzard stops the city, we grab our shovels and snowblowers and we help dig out our neighbors. We often do these acts of kindness just for complete strangers too. Not for reward, but because that's what decent people do for each other. And we shouldn't need a crisis to step outside of ourselves and find one another. We shouldn't have to rely on tragedy to reconnect and rediscover what makes us so strong and resilient. And so, this may be where some of you are waiting for my last big announcement. I'm sorry, I don't have one yet. But I know that there is something here, something that we need to pay attention to. So over the next few months, I'll be reaching out across the community to start a discussion. How can we remind ourselves to be neighbors to one another? What can we do to better understand what binds us together as people, as a community? How can we build on that? How can we share our stories of joy and fear and resilience so that we can better understand our shared humanity. 
What can we do to connect with each other when we're not called forth by a crisis? I want to hear from you on this. And I actually know you'll tell me. And together, I believe we can create a path and future of reconnection. So I, I'll end this speech as I started it with relationships and connections and the stories and history that bring us together. We have talked about housing and streets, engaging young people and fostering economic growth, making ourselves more energy resilient and harnessing our long history of entrepreneurialism. We have four core focus areas with urgent demands and plans to address difficult problems. And yet we know, we know that in the next few years, we'll be walking into a stiff headwind, a whirlwind of change in our world. But being Duluthians, we know a bit about the wind. And we know that when you hit a headwind, you must work together to withstand it. You take your turn leading into it. You take your turn blocking it from others. And you make sure that nobody gets left behind. It's a buddy system. <laughs> it is a buddy system that works. These past three years, I have learned that we can only overcome the challenges we face by facing them together. I can prod, I can agitate, I can direct resources, get behind good ideas, I can give good and super long speeches. <laughs> and that is all really important and even necessary, but it's not enough. We rise or fall as a community. We can only do this together. For together we are stronger, together we move forward, and only together will we build a more dynamic and vibrant and equitable city, filled with hope and fueled by compassion, fortified by purpose and fulfilled by our shared commitment to work towards our greatest good. A community where everyone, everyone feels respected, included, and welcomed, and cherished, and home. Thank you. <laughs>